1971, at 1.45 a.m., at the Leprechaun Bar located on 9th Avenue and 43rd Street in Hell's Kitchen, Mickey Featherstone, who had just snuck out of a psych ward a week prior after being mandated by the court upon beating his second murder case since returning home from Vietnam just two years before, would catch his third body after getting into a confrontation with a man named Linwood Willis. But something else about this night would change the course of history as far as organized crime in America, especially for the Irish gangsters in New York. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. This night would mark the day that Featherstone would develop a loyalty to the future boss of the violent West Side Irish mob, Jimmy Coonan, which would lead to a bloody, deadly, and feared alliance between Coonan and Featherstone that would terrorize the criminal underworld in New York City for years to come. The dynamic duo of hardened Irish gangsters from the gutters of Hell's Kitchen would accomplish something that had never been done before. The Westies would get the attention of the Gambino family, and a partnership would be formed. Although this power move would bring in more money than the Irish mob in Hell's Kitchen had ever seen before, this partnership would also be the downfall of the Coonan and Featherstone Alliance, as well as the downfall of the West Side Irish mob as a whole. Featherstone, who wasn't in the greatest mental space since returning home from serving as a Green Beret in Nam, was at the Leprechaun Bar when Linwood Willis mouthed off to him. Featherstone had some words back with the man and then exited the bar. Featherstone, who was traumatized from his time overseas and paranoid, went looking around the streets for someone he could borrow a gun from to go back and handle Willis when he spotted Coonan sitting at a booth in the back of Sonny's Cafe on 9th Avenue. Coonan and Featherstone had known each other basically their whole lives from the neighborhood, but they weren't exactly the closest of friends, but that would soon change. Mickey walked into Sonny's all the way to the back past Coonan, who was seated with a group of guys in a booth and Featherstone nodded for Coonan to come meet him in the bathroom. Once the two men were alone in the bathroom, Featherstone told Coonan he needed a gun, no questions asked. And without hesitation, Coonan reached around his back and pulled out a 25 caliber semi-automatic Beretta from his belt and handed it to Featherstone, only asking Mickey if he needed any help. Mickey responded, nah, this is something I gotta take care of myself. Featherstone would exit Sonny's cafe and make his way back to the Leprechaun Bar. And upon seeing his target, Linwood Willis, he lured him outside to the sidewalk in front of the bar and shot the man two times, hitting him once in the chest and the second one right between the eyes. Willis died on the spot and Mickey was picked up just blocks away and arrested. Featherstone was charged and tried but would be found not guilty by reason of insanity due to his mental health issues from being in the military, but would be sentenced on weapons charges in order to serve the next few years bouncing around from Matawan's prison for the criminally insane to the Bronx State Psychiatric Center and then Bellevue Hospital. But when he failed to return to the facility from a weekend furlough, Featherstone was sent to Attica Prison in upstate New York to finish the remainder of his time until being released in 1975. The whole time Mickey was serving his sentence, the one thing that he would hold on to through all of the chaos was the fact that when Featherstone asked Coonan to borrow that gun that night in Sonny's Cafe, Coonan helped him out without hesitation, and in a way, Featherstone felt he owed his loyalty to Coonan. Upon Mickey's return to Hell's Kitchen from prison, the famous Coon and Spillane Wars were in full effect. Mickey Spillane had inherited the position of boss of the West Side Irish mob from his protege, Huey Mulligan, in the early 1960s and was considered to be the last gentleman gangster of his era. Spillane operated and controlled the rackets on Manhattan's West Side, which caused obvious friction between the Italian Mafia and Spillane's crew, which came to be known as the Westies. Although the Italians had Spillane and the rest of the Irish gangsters outnumbered, Spillane still held down control of Hell's Kitchen, refusing to split the profits of the new Javits Center being built in Manhattan, 
during that time, which was a point of contention between Spillane and front boss of the Genovese crime family, Fat Tony Salerno. This beef would lead to Salerno hiring freelance Irish gangster and hitman Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan to execute three of Spillane's top enforcers and lieutenants, and forcing Spillane to relocate his family from Hell's Kitchen to Woodside, Queens for their protection. I'll cover the full details of the Coon and Spillane Wars, as well as the Fat Tony Salerno and Spillane beef in one of my future videos. While Featherstone was away, Coonan had been in and out of prison for charges related to the Coon and Spillane Wars and other things, but by autumn of 1970, he was a free man, and he had one thing on his mind, taking out Spillane. In order to compete with Spillane, Coonan invested in a local Hell's Kitchen bar he called the 596 Club because of its location on 596 10th Avenue and began Shylocking and learning the ins and outs of the business through an older gangster named Tony Luchik. And with the opening of the 596 Club and Shylocking business, Coonan began making a name for himself. A lot of the younger Irish gangsters in Hell's Kitchen became frequent faces at the 596, as well as some of the older gangsters who had been Spillane loyalists for years would frequent the establishment, and Coonan started stacking money he was making from his loan shark and racket. Coonan began realizing if he was going to kill Spillane and take over as new boss of the West Side Irish mob, he would need to put together a solid crew. Upon Featherstone's release from prison in 1975 and upon his return to Hell's Kitchen, Featherstone began frequenting neighborhood bars and saloons, one of which included the 596 Club. Right after his return, he began hearing stories about the murder of his good friend, Patty Dugan, which was said to be committed by Jimmy Coonan. So when Featherstone seen one of Coonan's crew members, Billy Beatty, at the 596 Club, he decided to inquire about the rumors he was hearing and asked Beatty to take a walk with them. Beatty, who was also Coonan's bartender at the 596, agreed and stepped outside with Mickey. While Mickey was in Sing Sing on a parole violation for consorting with the known felon, who happened to be Jimmy's brother, Jackie Coonan, Featherstone was also told that Beatty was the person who set Dugan up for Coonan and also wanted to press him on that issue. When they began walking, Featherstone asked Beatty why he set Dugan up to which Beatty responded by telling Mickey, quote, I had no fucking choice. They caught me while I was taking a shower and put guns to my head and forced me to call him. Mickey asked Beatty who they was, and Beatty told him, Coonan and Eddie Comiskey. At this point, Coonan ran down the block to catch up with the two and cut them off, telling Mickey, don't blame Billy. It ain't his fault. We forced him to do it. Mickey asked him why they had to kill Patty Dugan of all people, to which Coonan explained, Dugan kidnapped his bartender, Charlie Kruger, and held him for ransom in Coonan's own bar. And what really pissed him off was that Dugan called him at his home to tell him he wanted ransom money. Coonan then told Mickey to come back to the bar and he would explain everything. Coonan went on to explain he was at home, and Dugan kept calling his house phone back to back, telling Coonan he was going to kill Kruger and Coonan. And finally, Coonan got fed up and drove to the neighborhood to recruit an older Irish gangster, Eddie Comiskey, to help assist in killing Dugan, knowing Comiskey already had a beef with Dugan over the murder of another friend named Dennis Curley. So Coonan and Comiskey drove to Billy Beatty's house and forced him to lure Dugan over. When Dugan walked into Beatty's apartment, Comiskey shot him with the 32 caliber, then they dragged his body to the bathtub and began chopping it up. After they were finished, they disappeared the body. This was the first Featherstone was hearing of what would become Coonan's M.O., chopping up bodies. So he asked Coonan why they dismembered him, and Coonan responded, No corpus delicti, no investigation. In other words, no body, no case. Featherstone did know Comiskey was into dismembering his victims since he learned the skill while serving as the butcher in Attica prison, but was surprised Coonan was now using the same methods. Coonan then told Mickey how they put Dugan's head in a plastic garbage bag and incinerated it in the boiler room of Coonan's niece's tenement building. After discussing the details of the Dugan murder, Coonan then broke down what was going on in the neighborhood since Featherstone had been gone the past five years. He told them how he learned the loan shark business from Tony Luchik and how he had become close with Ruby Stein, who was a rich Jewish loan shark and very good friend of Fat Tony Salerno and how Coonan and Stein were doing business together, 
and also inform Mickey about his tip for tat that was going on between Coonan and Mickey Spillane. He told Featherstone his plans on taking out Spillane and taking over as new boss of the West Side Rackets. It was then that Coonan would ask Featherstone if he wanted in on the action, telling Mickey you've already been to prison for crazy stuff and you have a reputation for violence. At least if you were to come in with me, you could make some money. Featherstone always remembered Coonan lending him the gun that night of the Willis murder and felt indebted to Coonan, but still Mickey respectfully declined his offer for the time being. Then on August 20th, 1976, following the murder of Eddie Comiskey at the Sunbright Bar, committed by Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan, Coonan was worried that the Italians might be making a move on him and called Featherstone to meet him at the bar at the Skyline Motor Inn, but Coonan would once again ask Mickey to join him in taking over the Irish mob, telling Featherstone now that Comiskey was gone he needed someone to watch his back and asking him if he wanted a job working as protection for Coonan's loan shark operation, being Coonan's driver and bodyguard for $150 a week. Featherstone felt he owed Coonan and agreed to come in on the operation. Coonan and Featherstone quickly developed a routine where Coonan would drive into Hell's Kitchen from his house in New Jersey and pick Featherstone up where they would head to Tony Luchik's apartment on West 56th Street to meet Luchik and another neighborhood racketeer, Andy Wheeler, who acted as the crew's controller to pick up envelopes from the previous day's operations. One envelope was Shylock money, another envelope was the numbers money from the numbers business Coonan had took over from Spillane, and another envelope for peer money. After picking up Coonan's envelopes, he and Featherstone would then proceed to drive around and collect debts that were owed to Coonan, making stops at the Market Diner, the Sunbright, the 596 Club, Don O'Malley's Candy Store, William Whoopi Meyer's Auto Garage, and one of Carl Mazzella's produce stands. Although Coonan and Featherstone's reputations usually ensured payment, there were times that some of Coonan's customers needed to be reminded which is where Featherstone came in. He would sometimes have to slap or smack around neighborhood gamblers and restaurant and bar owners who were trying to stiff Coonan, and on a few occasions, they would be beaten and even have a pistol stuck in their mouth. Whenever the two were done making their rounds, the last stop would always be the Skyline Motor Inn Bar, where Coonan would meet the people he was fronting Shylock money, to which included Tommy Collins, Nick the Greek Cag of Beans, Billy Beatty, and a couple of others. Featherstone, who was new to this lifestyle, began developing a liking for the fear that him and Coonan instilled in people and began finding a new sense of worth. He looked up to Coonan and slowly but surely developed into a feared and violent gangster and racketeer himself, and he became fascinated by organized crime. Featherstone would also get married on October 28, 1976, to Sissy Featherstone, and although Featherstone enjoyed his new line of work, he didn't let his wife in on all the details. From 1976 to 1977, Coonan would continue growing his rackets and consolidating power. Mickey Splane had given up on some of his rackets after losing his ex-enforcer, Eddie Comiskey, because he no longer had the muscle he used to, and Coonan swooped right in to take control. And although Coonan's empire was expanding, to him it was just not enough. Coonan wanted to form a partnership with the Italians. To Coonan, the only way he would ever really make any kind of future in the life, he would need to get closer to La Cosa Nostra. He felt the Italians were more professional, more business savvy, and he thought the Italians were always ahead of the game. Before Comiskey was murdered, he had introduced Coonan to one of his co-workers at the sewage treatment plant on Ward's Island, Danny Grillo and Coonan had been getting to know Grillo, who was also a soldier in the crew of Roy DeMeo, a captain in the Gambino crime family, and Coonan seen this connection as his way in. Coonan began taking Featherstone and some of his other crew members out towards Island, where they would meet a man named Tony, and usually either Grillo, DeMeo, or both were there as well. Coonan was trying to get recognized by DeMeo, so he would take his crew there to show them off and let DeMeo know the work they'd been putting in, until one day Coonan finally told DeMeo they should do business, to which DeMeo agreed. Although Coonan felt this was his way to make it big time, Featherstone and other members of the Westies didn't think the Italians really cared for the Irish and really didn't trust them, 
At this point, Coonan had one track mind. Coonan would continue to get closer and closer to DeMeo, ultimately landing him a sit-down with Paul Castellano. But Castellano accepted the Westies as part of the Gambino family for a 10% kick-up. In Coonan's eyes, this was everything he had ever dreamed of, becoming one with the Italians. But Featherstone and the other members didn't see it that way. Before the sit-down between the Westies and the Gambinos, Roy DeMeo took it upon himself to whack Mickey Spillane as a favor to Coonan, which then solidified Coonan's position as new boss of the Westies. They now had full control of the West Side's rackets. Coonan, Featherstone, and other members would continue their violent reign, killing, dismembering, and disappearing bodies, and committing various crimes throughout New York City, landing Featherstone and Coonan in and out of jail and prison. Both men were charged for the murder of a man named Harold Whitey Whitehead after Coonan shot him down in the bathroom of the Placa bar for calling Coonan's brother a rat. The men who rushed out of the bar in a panic left behind evidence that linked them to the hit. A few months later, they would be charged and tried for the murder, but would end up being acquitted after one witness withdrew a sworn confession and another witness committed suicide instead of testifying. While they were in jail awaiting trial, Featherstone was also charged for the Mickey Spillane murder, but beat that case as well. And at the same time, another Westies member, Jimmy McElroy, was on trial for an unrelated murder, but also beat his case due to the Westies A1 lawyers they had representing them, which infuriated prosecutors and sent them on a mission to bring the Westies down. Coonan would be jammed up on a gun possession charge and sentenced to four and a half years, and Featherstone would get busted for a counterfeit money scam, but would land a sweet plea deal, earning him a reduced charge. The reason Featherstone had gotten involved with the counterfeit bills was to create his own revenue stream to separate from Coonan and the Italians, because he felt Coonan was selling out the West Side Irish to secure his own spot in the Gambinos. A sentiment that was shared by other members of the crew who still lived in Hell's Kitchen along with Mickey, while Coonan was spending his nights safely tucked away in New Jersey. One of the final straws that drew a wedge between Featherstone and Coonan was Coonan not coming through on his promise to Featherstone before they were separated at Rikers to serve their sentences, where Coonan promised Featherstone he would make sure his wife and kids were taken care of, and that when Mickey was done serving his time on a six-year sentence, he was given for the counterfeit money. Coonan promised Mickey there would be 50 grand cash waiting for him when he got out. But on July 26, 1983, after serving four years out of his six year sentence, Mickey was paroled and released to a Newark, New Jersey halfway house, only to find out there was no 50 grand. And in fact, all Mickey's wife was getting from Coonan through Jimmy's wife, Edna Coonan, was $150 a week which was Mickey's portion of the Shylock business. And in order to make sure she received the weekly payments, she would have to accompany Edna while she collected the Shylock money. Sissy Featherstone had a growing dislike towards Edna and Jimmy Coonan ever since Mickey was arrested in 1979 when she seen Edna racking in thousands a week from Coonan's rackets while she was struggling to stay afloat, even with the job. And after a while, Sissy got fed up with Edna, feeling like Mickey wasn't getting a fair cut. And when she moved from Hell's Kitchen to an apartment in Milford, New Jersey, she basically cut ties with Edna. Mickey and Sissy talked about how she felt they were being ripped off and urged Mickey to cut ties with Coonan. Mickey was upset with the Coonans because they didn't look out for his wife the way they should have, but decided he would let it go and also agreed he would cut ties. He got a job as a caterer in New Jersey and began trying to live a normal life. But the only problem was that Sissy and Mickey, who were now a family of four, needed a bigger apartment. They wanted a house, but knew they couldn't afford it, so Mickey decided he would go to Edna for a loan, despite Sissy being against it. Mickey met with Edna at her house and asked for a $40,000 loan. Mickey felt he was entitled to anyway. Edna told Mickey she had to talk it over with Coonan, and two weeks later, Mickey got his answer. It was a no. This infuriated Mickey after everything he had done for Coonan, and after Coonan promised him 50 grand and never came through. Mickey felt betrayed. Then, just two weeks later, at an engagement party for Edna's son, she approached Mickey telling him Jimmy had a proposition for him. 
She told Mickey Jimmy said he would give Mickey control of the piers, which was a lucrative racket, so he could get the money to buy the house. But he needed Mickey to kill three men for him. Bill Mayer, who was stealing from Coonan, skimming money, and reading secret correspondence from envelopes. Billy Beatty, who was a fellow Westie, but also Edna's ex before she was married to Coonan. And Vinny Leone, who the Coonan suspected was also ripping them off. Mickey told Edna he wasn't interested, to which she responded, Jimmy isn't going to be happy. Then later that same night at Edna's house where they went to continue the party, Edna pulled Mickey aside again, trying to convince him to do hits for Jimmy. But when Sissy came down and seen Edna flirting with Mickey, she lost her cool and threatened Edna to keep away from her husband or she would burn their house down. After that, Mickey got a union job at the Erie Transfer and things started to quiet down. But a couple of weeks after Mickey turned down Coonan's proposition, he was hanging out doing coke with Kevin Kelly and Jimmy McElroy, who had been handling things for the Westies since Coonan and Mickey were locked up. When they told him they took out Vinny Leone for Coonan, and he would give them control of the piers, but only if Mickey was taking it over with them. Mickey knew this was coming after telling Edna no that night, knowing Coonan wouldn't just let him walk away, so already had a pre-planned speech telling them he would only be in on it as long as he started getting paid for all of his work and getting money for all the people who were using his name around the neighborhood to make money. To which they assured Mickey things would be different from that one. From there, business started going good for Mickey. He started bringing in $4,000 a week and was able to get him and his wife their dream home in Jersey and he was expecting another son. But even though things were looking up for him financially, Mickey didn't like the way he had to be vicious and violent to keep the money coming in like he used to. He started to see a little bit of Coonan in himself and he didn't like it. Speaking of Coonan, he was due to be released from prison in less than a month. And although things appeared to be squashed between Coonan and Featherstone, there was still bad blood there. Mickey felt Coonan was disloyal and only looking out for himself. And he knew Coonan had to be upset that Mickey turned down the hits Edna gave him and Sissy threatening Edna probably wasn't helping. Coonan was released December of 1984 after serving time for an old assault charge and hold a few meetings with Mickey and the guys, informing them of his new plans. He felt that the Westies never retaliating against Michael Holly, who killed John Boken eight years prior, was a source of embarrassment and wanted him killed and also decided he was now going to be collecting the peer money envelopes which cut back Mickey and the other members' shares drastically, pissing off everyone in the crew. And once again, Coonan was rekindling his relationship with the Italians. Once he was gone, his former Gambino pal Roy DeMeo was whacked, but he was replaced by another Gambino, Dan Marino, as his new contact to the Italians. Right away, Coonan began to annoy Mickey. In one of his first meetups with Coonan, he was called to meet Coonan, Marino, and Muggsy Ritter, at a high-powered attorney, Jimmy LaRosa's office, where he was being pressured by Coonan and Marino to lie on Dominic Montiglio, who Mickey had spoken to at the sit-down between the Westies and the Gambinos, and they wanted Mickey to sign a bunch of papers saying stuff to discredit Montiglio, all to help Paul Castellano, who was about to go on trial. Mickey resented Coonan for trying to use him and have him put his freedom on the line for the Italians, so Mickey told them he didn't know the guy and left, only adding to the bad blood between the two. Then Coonan insulted Mickey in front of Marino in order to make himself look good, which really pissed off Mickey. And with all these things adding up by 1985, Mickey decided it was time for Coonan to go. 